Today we're in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. So let's begin by reading in 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3 and we'll get into our study. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The Apostle Peter writes, Therefore laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now as we look at this, we need to remember something. From verses 15 to the conclusion of chapter 1 at verse 25, the Apostle Peter has been writing concerning the characteristics of a believer in Jesus Christ. He's been writing concerning the character traits of a Christian and things that Christians will pursue and, and what Christians are to be known by. We realize that in our day, Christianity being 2,000 years old, uh, that there are many who have a misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian. Many times, they in their mentality of Christianity think in terms of certain rituals or certain church denominations and, and things of that nature. But in reality, Christianity is much deeper than the outer appearances of religiosity. It's a transformed life. It's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working within somebody who at, at one time had been estranged from God, cut off from God due to their sin, who has been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, and who has now been born again, born from above, by the Word of God which lives and abides, through the Holy Spirit's work, they become the temple of the Spirit of God, and they now have certain characteristics, they have certain attributes, if you will, and that's what we've been looking at in chapter 1. So from verses 15 to 25, the Apostle Peter was basically describing the character traits or characteristics of a Christian. He had said that believers in Jesus Christ are going to be earmarked by a holy life, he said, believers understand that they're sojourners and they're not attached to the things of this world, that they have a reverential fear of the Lord, that they understand the cost of salvation, which was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Believers no longer live aimless lives, but that they actually have faith and hope in God through Jesus Christ. And believers have received the gospel and have obeyed. And this has produced sincere and fervent and a pure love for one another. And we've been looking that in, at that in chapter 1. And then we noted that he concluded by uh, contrasting man's glory with the word of God. And, and he had pointed out that the glory of man fades away, but the word of the Lord, he said, that endures forever. In other words, God's word can never be rendered ineffective. And it is this word that we have that we have heard that has been revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ that produces spiritual life in believers. Now because of that, because of these things, he begins this section with the word therefore. In other words, taking into consideration everything that he has said from verse 15 to verse 25, he can begin this section by simply saying therefore. In other words, seeing that all these things are true. This is what you're supposed to do. And he says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. All evil speaking. Therefore, because you're born again. Therefore, because you understand who God is through Jesus Christ. Therefore, because you have a fear of God and live a holy life. Because those things are true and the word of God abides forever. Because all of those things are true. There's something you need to do and that is you need to lay aside certain things. So what he's speaking about is the lifestyle of a believer, how Christians actually act and what we put away. And he speaks concerning laying aside these things. Now, when he uses the word laying aside, he's speaking of the fact that there are things that, that we are going to remove from ourselves. The way that you might remove some soiled clothing, there are certain things that you remove from yourself. You lay aside malice. You lay aside all guile and hypocrisy. You lay aside envy and you lay aside evil speaking. In other words, we've received the Word of God, and that's going to be evidenced through a new way of life. That life that we live is going to be earmarked not by malice and things, but that life that we're going to be living now in faith in Christ will be earmarked by love, love for God and love for the people of God. It's like what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
Now, I'm assuming that most of us in this room didn't use the word propitiation this week in common conversation. The word propitiation means to satisfy the righteous anger of God, that Jesus Christ came to satisfy the anger of his father because his father is portrayed in scripture as being angry over sin. So what did God do? Well, the Bible says Jesus came and satisfied the anger of his father, and he did so by laying his life down voluntarily. And so he is the propitiation for our sins. But he goes on to say, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God loved us in that dramatic a fashion, in that powerful a fashion, that he actually gave his son in order that we might be reconciled to him, that he gave his son because anger had made a separation through the sin that we practice and the sin that we are by nature uh, carriers of and producers of. If God so loved the world that he gave his son, then obviously we ought to love one another. And we've been seeing that. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, we're to love one another. In 1 John 4, 21, he said, This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And so, if we've been born again, and we're becoming an entirely new person, well, Peter now instructs and commands them about what it means to be born again. It's interesting when you look at these sins and these vices that these are the things that destroy community. These kinds of sins when practiced and found in the body of Christ actually divide churches. And he's saying in verse 1 that these are the sins that are to be laid aside. Now when he speaks of laying these things aside, you might want to note something with me. He's speaking of personal decisions and the discipline that we must have as people of Christ. These sins are not automatically eliminated when you're saved, but they are forsaken voluntarily. They're things that you actually will lay aside with a mind to. I don't want this in my life anymore. The soiled clothing of my life needs to be taken off. I need to remove those things. So that calls for a decision and that calls for discipline. It's the same kind of thing that the Apostle Paul speaks about when you read the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, verses 22 and 23 when he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind. So you put off that old self. It's the same thing found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, when he says, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Put those things off. Now, what are the things that the Apostle Peter speaks about? Well, one, he speaks of malice. Again, malice isn't a word that we normally use in everyday conversation simply because it's not a typical word that we as Americans will use. And so sometimes we don't know what the word actually means. The word malice is really something that's a very strong word. It speaks of ill will. It's the desire to injure. Malice is this attitude of, of wanting somebody to, to, to hurt. It's, it's that that attitude that somebody has done you wrong, so every day you read the obituaries hoping to see their name there. I mean, I, that's malice, man. I mean, I want something bad to happen to them. And he's saying, you put that off. You're not to have that. You're not to yield to this desire to get even and this malicious desire to see evil done to somebody else. Because if you have malice, then love for others is going to be quenched. Paul said the same thing in Ephesians 4.31 where he said, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now why would he have that bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice? Why would he have that in such an order? When you look at it, you see it, it actually progresses. Malice actually is the result of bitterness. Bitterness gives way to wrath which gives way to anger, which gives way to clamor, which gives way to evil speaking, speaking of other people, which gives way to malice. And he's saying you need to be careful because these things progress and get even worse over time. So we're not to be harboring malice for other people. Now that runs consistent with what Jesus said. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 said it like this. He said, I say unto you, love your enemies, Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. 
Instead of rendering evil for evil, Jesus said, learn to pray for those who hate you. Because in doing so, you actually become a child of God. You actually begin to, to demonstrate heavenly parentage. So like filthy clothing, Peter says, lay aside malice, because malice destroys. He speaks of guile, and he speaks of hypocrisy. Guile and hypocrisy. Uh, guile speaks of that insincerity. Uh, hypocrisy is putting on a mask. You're, you're pretending to be one thing when in reality you're something else. He says, put these things away. Put away this insincerity. Put away this deceit with an appearance of truth, this pretense. He says, put it away because, because this is not something that the Lord would have us to have. Insincerity and hypocrisy can actually destroy churches. These sins are especially ugly when performed by those who profess to be believers. Jesus in Matthew 15, verse 8 said, These people draw near to me with their mouths. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And so he says, put those things away. Then he speaks of envy. Lay aside envy. Envy. Envy is that discontent, that resentment that is aroused by a desire for the possession, possessions of someone else. Envy, it's, it's that longing to have what somebody else has, wishing that you had it and they didn't. It's, it's what can come up in your heart when, when somebody across the street that you know pulls into their driveway with a new car and they say, hey, look what I got, look how the Lord has blessed me, and you're out there watering your, your lawn and, and you turn and you look at your car that that just really is it's a, it's, it's a hoopy. I mean, it's not something that you really like. And, and, you know, and, and you're looking at this piece of junk that actually has smoke signals pouring out of the exhaust pipe when you're driving down the, the road. It won't even start when you want to start it. You know, it's the car that you don't care if people bang with their doors when they swing the door open. It, it, you don't care anymore. And you're, you're looking at this guy, he's got all this everything that you wish you could have, and you're smiling at him saying, oh, praise the Lord, brother. And then you go in and you give an Old Testament prayer, oh Lord, may, four, may his four tires fall off while he's on the freeway in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> envy. People have envy and don't even realize it. It's desiring what somebody else has, wishing you had it, and it can go even deeper. Jealousy is, is the desire of somebody else's possessions. Envy goes a little deeper. It's more like desiring what they have and you're wishing they didn't have it themselves. It's really a, a deep thing, you know, and, and, and by the way, envy sells very well uh, today in the United States because there are many people in a society that uh, gives trophies for showing up to a game instead of winning the championship. We, we're all winners, aren't we? And in one way or another, we at least been told that all of our lives. We get to the point where we actually believe that we should have anything that we really want. And that person has a nice car, I really want that. That person has a lot of money, I really want that. I deserve that. Envy is that mentality that they don't deserve it and I do. And I don't want them to have it, I should have it. Envy. Envy can be used as a tool. And it is used today as a tool. Definitely. We know that, don't we? I mean, you've got this fictitious battle going on that's been created between the one percenters and the 99 percenters. What is that? What, if that's not envious, what is it? But that's what it is. You have sincere people on both sides, but I have to be honest with you, it's really finding itself being fueled by envy. And that's a sin. And for us to wish that other people didn't have something because I wanted it, well, he says, put that aside. In James chapter 3, verse 16, James said, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Well, envy gives rise to evil speaking. Evil speaking is slandering, it's backbiting, it's defaming people. It's been said the tongue is a ready and willing instrument to talk about our neighbor behind their back. Leviticus 19 verse 16 says, Do not go about spreading slander among your people. The psalmist in Psalm 15 verses 1 through 3 said it like this. He said, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? And then he answers his own questions. He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man. People today 
seem to, and I think it's been true pretty much always, but it's more acceptable, at least it appears more accept acceptable today, are, are very prone to slander people. They're very prone to speak evil of them. You can see it in Facebook all the time. People just griping about this and griping about that and just putting it down. And all of these social medias that we have, you find a whole lot of people complaining quite often and sometimes talking about others and they have no problem doing that. And when confronted, when told, you know, that's really called gossip, that's really evil speaking, that's really not, not right. They'll say, hey, who are you to judge me? I can say what is on my heart and I'm being transparent and real. And so they actually make a virtue out of a vice. And so the Bible says, you don't do that. You don't slander people. You don't speak ill of people. It's not right. Now, what's interesting, Peter doesn't tell his readers to fight against these evils. Notice that. What he says is, lay them aside. Now, how is that possible? How can I lay these things aside? Well, he's already been saying that. We put off our old nature and we put on the new, our new life in Christ. We, we begin to recognize these things as sin. And as we recognize this as sin and recognize that we can be guilty of them, we confess and forsake them. That's how you get rid of them. And the way to do that, by the way, is just spend some time in the Word. The more you're, you're reading the Bible and seeing the way that God is and what God wants from us and how we can live to please Him, well, the more prone you are, if you're a believer in Christ, to want to do those things that please Him, to draw closer to Christ. And, and if I've got something in my life that keeps me from Him, then I need to forsake that. I need to confess it if it's a sin, and I need to move on to pursue Him. So he's saying we need to confess and forsake these things. That's how you put them off. That's how you lay these things aside. But he goes on to say in verse 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Desire the sincere or the pure milk of the word. If these vices are to be des destroyed, it occurs when you hunger for the milk of God's word. If you want to grow up in the things of the Lord, a sincere desire for his word will accomplish this. Peter's already stated that they're born again by the Word of God. He now speaks to them as believers. He's referring now to changed lives. So as Christians, they're to desire food that is suited to their new nature. Spiritual food is required for spiritual maturity. And that he refers to as the pure milk of the Word. Now, what he's asking them to do is actually exhorting them to depend on God. You see, babies depend on their mother's milk. Believers are nourished by God's Word. The fact is, hunger for God's Word is a real good indicator of a person's spiritual life. Hunger for the Word of God indicates that you have a relationship with God. You see, dead people don't eat. I, I've never seen a hearse in front of a jack-in-the-box. They may be in one because they ate a jack-in-the-box, but that's something else. But have you ever seen a hearse roll up and the coffin open up and the guy asks for a taco? It doesn't happen, does it? Why not? Because dead people don't eat. A living person does. One of the ways that you can determine your walk with God is your hunger for His Word. It's very simple. Do you have a hunger for the Word of God? If you do, that indicates life. If you don't, it may indicate that you don't have life. It may indicate that. Because living people are hungry people. That's just the way it is. I've shared this with you before. It bears repetition as an illustration at this point. When Marie gave birth to our firstborn, Corinne, Marie wanted to be a nursing mama, and indeed she, she became a nursing mother. And Corinne, well, my daughter Corinne was a demanding baby. I can still remember walking up to Marie while she was nursing our baby who was maybe three months at, or four months old at the time. And I walked close to Marie because I was telling her something as she was nursing. And Corinne released herself from her mother long enough to turn and growl at me with that toothless, angry little face. <laughs> I mean, I still remember it. She turned and she goes, ah, like that, the toothless little thing. And, 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 and I got quiet. And then she went back to nursing. And so I said, Marie? And she turns away again, and, and, and Corinne looks at me again, Arr! like that. I discovered, oh my, this little girl's got a temper. And so that was just true with her. And so I remember one day I was going to work, and I worked only 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from where I lived. And Marie was downstairs, and she was 
She was nursing the baby. It was like 7.45 and I'm about to leave and I walk up to Marie to kiss her goodbye. Corinne turns and growls goodbye to me and, and I tell Marie, I'll, I'll, I'll see you later, baby. And I walk out, I go to work. Now I lived close enough to come home for lunch and so I did. I drove in and I walk into our apartment and Marie is in the same place that she was when I left, and it's like 11.30 or something. She's been there for over three hours, laying there. And she goes, she won't let go. She won't let go. I said, really? She says, watch. And she grabs her head and pulls her away, and all of a sudden you hear, ah, she starts screaming. She lets go, and boom, she reattaches. And I said, I'll be back. I went, I made a sandwich, I ate, I went to work. I came back around 4, 4.30 whenever I got off work. I walked in and I found Marie. She looked like a giant spider had just taken all her juices. She's just all sucked dry. <laughs> that baby was still nursing. She wouldn't let go. For eight hours she was attached. So she's getting counseling now. But uh, <laughs> if there's anything that indicated beyond several other things, is that she was alive and she wanted to nurse. She was attached and wouldn't let go. And a baby desires the sincere or the pure milk. And so he's saying even as a nursing baby nourishes, receives nourishment from the mama through the breast milk, even so you as one who's alive in Christ are to receive your nourishment from God's word. God's word is sufficient to save you. That's how you got saved. You heard the gospel. You realized that you needed Jesus. You committed yourself to him. You confessed your sin, forsook them, received Christ as Lord and Savior. That's how you were saved. But you now hunger for the word of God too. It is something that you need to have in your life. It's like Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. The word of God's value is without estimate. The psalmist in Psalm 19, verse 10, speaking of the word of God and God's commands, says it this way, They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 97 said, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Or Psalm 119, verses 101, verse 101, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This, this indicator that God's word is sweet and God's word orders your life and God's word produces blessing is something you find in the Old as well as the New Testament. And it indicates that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your hunger for God's word and your desire to obey him. Interestingly enough, though, the Apostle Paul, writing concerning the times that would exist that are called the last days, made it very clear that a lack of hunger for God's word would be typical he said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 4, he said, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. They will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and will voluntarily turn away from truth. That's the sign of the last days. We are living in those days. We know that, don't we? We are living in a day when people no longer put up with healthy doctrine. They don't want to hear healthy doctrine. They want to hear things that make them feel better about themselves. They read their materials, and they're not, you know, when we have a bookstore, it's not the theological books that sell. It's usually the self-help books that sell, or how to have your best day-to-day -day kinds of books. And that, that's, what, that's what happens. 
That's what people want. They want to be victorious today. They want to be blessed today. They don't understand that that part of blessing is blessing is going to come when you get the whole counsel of God. But they don't want the whole counsel of God, Paul said in the last days. So they're open to be deceived because they're going to heap unto themselves teachers that tell them exactly what they want to hear. The question has to be asked, why listen to the Word of God? Why should I hunger to read His Word? Why should I meditate on the Word of God, memorize it? And why should I practice it? Well, it's that you may grow spiritually. As a mother looks to see her child grow, God desires to see His children grow. You see, birth is not the ultimate level of growth, and salvation is something that you grow into. Marriage can be used as an illustration here. You got saved. Some people think, well, salvation's just all I need. So you get saved and you continue in the way that you lived before. At least you went forward. At least you raised your hand. At least you prayed or whatever. And so you think of yourself as being a saved individual and you think, well, that's it. Now that I'm saved, I can go on with my life. It's like marriage. Somebody's getting married. Here we are in the church. There's the bride standing in the back there. The doors have opened up. The music is playing. She's standing there in her beautiful gown. And here I am standing with the groomsmen and the victim. And as we're here together, and she's walking up, and that music is playing and all of that, we're having a wedding. It's a wedding celebration, and everybody's excited about it. But I wouldn't expect them to leave here, go to the reception, and have them stand up and give a lecture on what marriage is, how marriage can be successful, what God has done to demonstrate in their lives what a marriage really is, because what do they know? They just got married. They don't have any idea what marriage is. They're now just excited because they went through a wedding ceremony. And as they went through the wedding ceremony and all their guests are there, they're very happy. And they're moving on to their honeymoon. And honeymoons normally are a lot of fun. And they spend time together and they're going to go places they normally wouldn't go and will never go again, ladies. Am I wrong? And they, <laughs> and they enjoy that. I mean, for them, it's just a great thing. See, it's just the wonder of getting married. But they don't have any advice to give. How could they give it? Now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, they know misery. I mean, they know marriage. <laughs> they're, able, they're able to share. They're able to say, these are the things we learned in the first few years. These are the things we learned in the first 10 years. This is what we learned when we had our children, should they have kids. This is what we've learned as they've gone through their teen years. These, now you've got experience. Now you can talk about it. But you can't talk with authority concerning those things, not on your wedding day. You have to live as a married person for a while to gain experience. So a lot of people think, well, I got saved. That's the end of the road. That is not the end of the road. That's the beginning of the road. And that's why you hunger for the Word of God. That's why you stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because getting saved isn't the whole journey. It's the beginning in 2 Peter 3.18, the apostle says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head, that is, Christ. So getting saved isn't the whole journey. It's just the beginning. But he goes on to say, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Again, using marriage as an analogy, many of you have done this. You're going to have a reception. You're planning on feeding a few people. You're looking for a caterer. You find somebody that sounds reasonable. They have what is called a tasting. So you go and you sit down with these people, and they will bring a small portion. Maybe they'll bring a portion of fish. They'll bring some chicken. They'll bring some beef. It's a small portion. And then you'll taste those things. Then they'll bring in a salad and you taste the salad. They'll bring in the desserts, and they're all small portions. And that's how you select what you want to serve to your guests, right? That's what you do. So you'll taste the fish, and maybe you like fish, and you'll say, this is great, this is very, very good, or the chicken or the beef, whatever it may be. But the taste, sometimes you'll say, that's so good, I'd like to try that again. As a matter of fact, I'd like to eat a, eat a whole plate of that. This is so good, and that salad is so great, and that dessert's too much. And that's what happens. You see, what, what God wants us to do is not just take a sample. He wants us to consume. He wants us to, to be filled with it. If you've tasted that the Lord is good, is what he's talking about. Not sampled God. 
The Lord doesn't call me to give him a chance. Let me show you how good I am. He says, I want you to be complete in me. I want you to have all of me. I want to be in your life completely. Don't just taste of me in a sampling way, but consume the reality of what it means to walk with God. If you've experienced salvation, you're going to experience a desire for more and more of the Lord. Even as you enjoy a wonderful meal, he's saying you need to enjoy the tasting and the goodness of the Lord. It's like what it says in Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. That's an invitation, by the way, if you have tasted. But if you haven't, you need to. You need to take of the Lord and see that he's good. You need to get away from any ritual that you're trusting in. You need to get away from this concept that I can work my way into heaven by being a good person or at least better than the person next to me. You need to understand, as I have had to understand, and we who are believers have had to, had to understand, I'm a sinner cut off from God by my sin. But God sent Jesus, who's the propitiation for my sin. And Jesus satisfied the righteous demands and the anger of his, of his Father by taking upon himself my sin. And it's not that I just feel guilty about what I've done. It's not that I have remorse over what I've done. Yes, I have guilt, and yes, I feel bad. But that's not repentance. Repentance is a radical change of mind. I was going in one direction, and I'm turning around, and I'm going in a different one. Repentance is a, is a mentality of, of, of seeing God for who he is and seeing myself for who I am and turning from who I am so that I might turn to who he is, turn to him. That's repentance. It's not giving God a, a try. It's not taking a sample. It's committing myself completely. And so, if I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, if I have, if I have hungered for his word, and I'm putting off these things like, like malice and all, that demonstrates that I understand that the word of the Lord endures forever. It demonstrates that I understand that I need to be born again by the word of God that lives and abides forever. It demonstrates that I understand that my God is holy and therefore I'm to walk in a holy, a separated life from the things that God has saved me from, which demonstrates the reality of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Transformed lives. That's how it works. So when somebody says, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm walking with Jesus, and they're telling you that while they're drunk, you have a good reason to wonder whether they understand what Jesus is all about, because they haven't walked away from their old life at all. They're living in it, and they're probably deceiving themselves to think that they're right with God, because they may have sampled something by hearing an invitation, but they haven't consumed the reality of who God is through a transformed life. And that's what Peter is talking about. He said, lay these things aside, because as a newborn baby desires the milk of the word, you need to desire God's word if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And if you've encountered his grace, your life is going to change. And that's how the apostle is putting it here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3.